here in Kazuko we have a, a whole range of different projects uh, that our scientists are running that uh, the students get involved in. The core projects that we have are um, amphibian and reptile monitoring, invertebrate surveys, bird abundance and diversity, so we have morning point counts and mist netting that's going on, and we also have uh, the same thing for, for bats, so we're doing mist netting every evening for bats to monitor change in the bat communities. We have small mammal surveys, large mammal surveys, and a whole range of, of other specialist projects that are happening throughout the park all the time that, that change from year on year. One of the biggest projects that we have running though, um, kind of the most important for conservation is our habitat surveys and assessments. So we are estimating carbon abundance and forest structure and type. That allows us to calculate the value of the, the carbon that's actually held in the park. So under Red Plus um, funding mechanisms, we can hopefully access funds that will then go directly to the community to fund sustainable development. The Dung Beetle Research in Kasuko has been running since 2006. Uh, this is a monitoring project that has been um, gathering the largest invertebrate data set in Central America. Um, we're doing this for two reasons. One, to look at uh, how dung beetles can act as indicators for larger um, animals. And secondly, to look at the ecology of dung beetles in such a uh, remote and interesting park such as this. The ecological studies that we'll get out of this are going to be unparalleled. We had a light trap on the first night and we caught these really huge moths that were like this big and a few jeweled scarab beetles which are actually only found in the park which is a really interesting thing to find and have kind of crawl over your hands. And as far as the amphibian specific projects that we're working on, what we're really doing is investigating the prevalence of chytrid fungus, the fungus that's causing amphibian declines worldwide. And then we actually have a nice PCR machine back at base camp so we can right away know if the frogs or the other amphibians that we're catching are, are infected with fungus or not. So the research assistants at the marine sites in Honduras get a really good opportunity to get involved in a wide range of projects and that's why they're really useful to us because we can move them between the projects that need that real impetus at a particular week or a particular day to help us get all the data sets and the little pieces of the puzzles we need to address the questions that we're trying to answer. So generally they'll spend their time on either utila or Tella or a combination of both. Some of the really key projects that we use research assistance for include the broad monitoring of the coral reefs, supporting our scientists collecting data on um, coral cover on the reefs, fish community structure for example. They also help a lot with environmental profiling of the reefs, so collecting data using sediment traps, using secchi disks to look at things like turbidity of the water column, taking temperature readings for example. But they also help a lot with the data sets on things like lionfish, where we capture lionfish, bring them back to shore, and as they're an invasive species, we're very keen to understand what influence and impact they're having on the reefs. Um, so we chop them up, do some dissections with them, have a look at what they've been eating, size, sexual maturity, gender, data like that. And the research assistants are really key because we process several hundred um, lionfish every summer.
The species of sea urchin that I'm looking at in the Caribbean is uh, Diadema antelarum, uh, and there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that it is the keystone species for the maintenance of a healthy coral reef in the Caribbean. There was an epidemic in the early 80s that just came along and completely decimated the populations, reducing them by between 95 to 99 percent, uh, and a lot of areas throughout the Caribbean actually caused local extinction. Uh, and what we've found since we have had that disease is that there's been an almost complete lack of recovery. So we would have expected the urchin populations to be increasing since that point in time, uh, but really throughout the Caribbean we find that on average they've recovered to about 6.5 percent of their previous pre-mortality densities. If we can help to increase those urchin populations throughout the Caribbean, it's possible we might be able to reintroduce some of those ecosystem services, which could ultimately kind of increase the health of the reef, which would not only have beneficial ecological effects, but hopefully beneficial socioeconomic effects as well. One of the key things about coming out here is that if you've got a passion for coral reefs and you're stuck back in the UK or the US or Canada or wherever it is you may be, um, we don't have access to this kind of environment. Uh, and I think individuals who are coming here really, really benefit from it. It gives them access to this world that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. For quite a while now, coral reef biology has been trying to, to move in a more technological direction where we, we replace human bias with actual technological readings and measurements. And the first opportunity we had to use this was with the stereo video system, which is a way of improving data collection on, on reef fisheries. And it's a very simple setup. We're having two high definition video cameras. You actually analyze those two videos afterwards and software can overlay the footage to create a, a 3D or a proxy 3D um, idea of what the fishery is looking like. You can calculate exact lengths uh, and then you can obviously use that to calculate biomass. So again, it opened up a whole new area of calculation for, for fisheries biology on coral reefs. We have a project next summer developing 3D modelling of coral reefs. It's going to open a lot of new avenues for research that just haven't existed before and in a way it's going to be a game changer with, with marine biology and with, with coral reef biology in particular. The opportunities for it are enormous and almost endless so we're, we're looking forward to seeing where it goes.